Um, okay, there's a, your first assignment is out there on the website. Um, that's where everything will go, uh, everything we know and do and uh, will be out there on the website. Um, so uh, um, I will uh, get out there and read it. In short, um, I'm asking you to do three small programs that will get you started on QT, get you started on some OpenGL graphics, um, and let you play around with buttons and sliders and things like that to get things, get things moving before we start doing things that are, that are a little bit more complex. Um, there's three little programs. One is I'm going to make you look up a classic curve. On, the best way to look it up is in Wikipedia um, and, uh, and plot that. Something called a space filling curve, which is uh, how do you, f how do you uh, take a curve that fills up an entire square, right, for example. And uh, these space filling curves were kind of these interesting curiosities back in the 1970s that people did. And all of a sudden they, become, they have become hugely relevant because uh, when we have a map uh, or uh, aerial data or something that we want to store out on disk, uh, frequently, we can get the aerial data for the state of Washington, which is an image that's about 1.4 million by 1.4 million pixels. It's a little bit too big to fit in memory, right, for example, uh, with all of its things. And so we store it out on disk. And then the problem is where we, wherever we are, how do we index it? Well, with the, a space filling curve gives us a way to kind of linearize this map, right? And uh, we use a space filling curve to figure out where the map is on disk, store the disk in a space filling curve. So these space filling curves, even though they're really cool, they're just little recursive programs, even though they're really kind of just cool curiosities, they have all of a sudden come to the fore when you're really trying to do great big huge data. Right? This is how you store them out on disk and how you access them. Um, so when we fly a plane over the state of Washington, we don't access all the data. We only access a little bit of it where we are. And uh, we have to know where that data is. We use it by looking at one of these interesting little curves. And you're going to be asked to do one of the classic ones uh, in this course. But the other one is something, is something I alluded to it last time called Chaikin's Curve. And that's what I'm going to do today is show you where Chaikin's Curve comes from, show you why, right, et cetera, and uh, kind of show you how we generalize it. Um, this started about. This whole field, this whole idea started about 1972, right? George Chaikin gave a lecture, I think, in 1974. I think I was looking, if I look it up correctly, he gave this, his lecture in 1974. There was a fellow named Bézier, Pierre Bézier, who worked for Renault Car Company in France. Um, Pierre uh, is uh, uh, still around, actually. Um, He's an old white-haired gentleman, but uh, he actually kind of is, is thought of as the inventor of this field and of this whole thing. The, the field bears his name, Bezier Curves, right? in which George Chaikin has something that is made up of Bezier Curves. Um, but uh, Pierre Bezier from Renault Car Company, it turns out there was another gentleman named De Castillo uh, who was also at, at the competitor at Citroën Car Company in France who did exactly the same thing in exactly the same year, at exactly the same time. They didn't talk, of course. They were competitors. Except Bézier was allowed to publish his results, and de Castillo was not. Right? So the field bears Bézier's name. It's kind of interesting. The field bears Bézier's name, even though you know, the French keep waving their hands all the time, saying, oh, well, there's another fellow, too, that should, you know, should be here. But so this is what I'm going to do. And, and the whole idea here is as follows. It's basically. How do you represent a curve in a computer system? Okay, you're going to find out it's really easy to do polygons. Okay, we're going to do polygons all the time. They're nice and flat. Shading is really well understood. Pretty easy to do triangles, which are polygons, but really simple ones. Okay, those. But how do you do nice, smooth things, right, in a computer system? That's going to be one of the things that we face as we go along. How do you do nice, smooth things? What you do is you start, well, we're going to start from curves today, but, but we're going to get to surfaces really easily because there's an, a surface an analog to Chaikin's curve um, as we go along. And uh, what we have today are something called subdivision surfaces, which are exactly what George Chaikin had in mind. Right? It, they didn't come along until the mid to late 90s in our field. But they're incredibly easy to describe the algorithm to. You can describe the algorithm to a sixth grader 
have them understand perfectly what goes on. Implementing it is another interesting thing, but you can describe the algorithm really easily. But the idea is how do you get smooth curves, okay? So suppose this was the problem. Suppose I, I've been, uh, uh, the campus has been saving money on chalk, okay? Hmm. Suppose I want to make a cur this curve, right? And I want to draw it with a computer system. And it happens to represent something that, that I'm interested in. Well, the problem being is that, is that we know how to plot curves if we know what the function is. Okay? Maybe, I mean, this is what you do in early math. If you know what the function is, you can plot the curve. They teach you all kinds of ways to plot it and how to get critical points and everything else. Okay? But what if an artist draws this or an artist draws a fender on your car, okay, or the boot on a Renault, which is what Bézier was working on, Right? And how do you, what's the function? And the answer is, we don't know. Okay? What's the function for this curve? Right? And the answer is, we don't know. Well, these guys are the first ones to actually give us an inkling of how to do this. Okay? So, here's Chaikin's algorithm. I'll explain, explain it to you really easy. Here's Chaikin's algorithm. I'll explain it really easily. And it goes like this. And, uh, yeah, I mean, also with a computer system, that thing is a continuous thing, right? Continuous curve, right? And we don't do continuous things in computer algorithms. We do discrete things, right? We only have n things in our array that we can access, okay? And so uh, how do you do n things here? Well, you put mm, millions of little tiny points on here, right, and draw little tiny straight lines between them, and it'll look pretty good until you zoom in, okay? And the idea was, how do you do this? How would you do this? And Chaikin had the kind of the, one of the first ideas, okay? So here we go. Here's George Chaikin's algorithm. Let's take some points, okay? Uh, and many people call these the Chaikin's points. Chaikin's points... Many people call them Bezier points, okay? I call them control points, okay? And what I want to do is I want to use these points to develop a curve, okay? Some kind of a curve on the inside. And it doesn't have to be that all the points go, or any of the points go through the curve, okay? I should, a uh, little box up here. Mathematicians always do something called an interpolating curve, right? So that they can, if they had, say, four points here, they could get a curve that went through all four points. And it's not too bad. I mean, you can do this. You usually get this in the first couple weeks of a numerical analysis course. How do you do an interpolating curve? Okay. Um, the trouble with the math, this, this thing that they present to us all the time is we can't use it. And the reason is because suppose we want to do a straight line. And here are our points, okay? And they're a straight line. You should get a straight line out of them, right? Right, when you do this, if, if you're doing this correctly, they all go through there. But the problem was, was suppose you had a little tiny bit of noise, right? And that this point was really up there, right? And this was the problem that all the designers of automobiles had, is because what happens is, if you try to do this one, what you get is this out of their interpolating curve. Hmm, it goes through all the points, right? But it should be a straight line, almost. And it's not. It's really weird, okay? And this started people like Chaikins and Bezier and other people start looking at these other ways of doing things, okay? So just, this is just a little aside of, you know, I went through the math years and we had to learn all this, okay? It, and it doesn't work. Nobody uses it. Nobody uses these interpolating polynomial type things. Here's what George Chaikin did, which was really clever, and he blew everybody away in this little lecture he did. He said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the point on, this, on each line segment. I'm going to take a point here. Let me use X's. One quarter of the way and three quarter of the way along the line segment. Okay? And I'm going to take one quarter here and three quarters of the way along this one. I'm going to take one quarter and three quarters of the way along this one. And I'm going to take one quarter and three quarters of the way along that one, okay? And then what I'm going to do is, and I need some colored chalk, what I'm going to do is connect the dots.
Okay? Right? One quarter, three quarter, one quarter, three quarter, one quarter, three quarter. And I'm going to connect the dots. That's all he said. Well, that's step one of the algorithm. What's step two? You can do it again, right? Okay, one quarter, three quarter. I don't have color chalk, right? One quarter, three quarter uh, circles this time. One quarter, three quarter, 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 right? Okay? And connect the dots. Uh, see what's going to happen? Right? And what you get is this curve like this. We call this type of an algorithm a corner cutting algorithm. Can you see why? Because it's as if we're chopping off the corners, right? It's as if we're chopping off the corners. Okay? One quarter, three quarter, one quarter, three quarter, one quarter, three quarter. Next step is do it again and again and again and again and again and again. Okay? And what do you get when you get out? If you finally connect the dots of all these little things, right, you get a curve, uh, which kind of looks like this. Okay? Kind of looks like that. You get a, what appears to be a curve. And the cool thing about it is this algorithm is iterative. We can do it as many times as we like. Okay? Uh, students who usually program this, and I, and I was one of, the, <laughs> one of these, when I did it, right? You do I equal 1 to 100,000, do this 100,000 times, it's cool, right? And you get out 18 million line segments. Okay, more than that, because this effectively doubles the number of little segments every time, almost, right? Way more than that. And it in your machine just nicely dies, right? Um, you have to be a little careful here and think about what you're doing. But can you see, I mean, you can explain this algorithm to a sixth grader, right? I mean, it's really simple to do. One quarter, three quarter, one quarter, three quarter. And um, you can see a couple things, right? The curve actually goes through, I think, the midpoint in the limit. Let me talk about in the limit, right? In the limit, the curve goes through the midpoint of that line segment, I think, right? Because we, uh, we keep shortening it each time by half the weight of the line segment. In the limit, it actually, it's actually going to get there. Same thing over here. Same thing up here. It goes through the midpoint. Goes through the midpoint. Okay, and any of the little line segments, the eventual curve actually goes through the midpoint, which is kind of cool. Okay, midpoints involved. Um, but you can do this with almost any curve. Okay. Also notice that um, the way Ken draw. I have to ask you to kind of believe me here. But when you look at this, where where this curve touches the midpoint, the tangent line to the curve here at this midpoint at this point is the same as the slope of that line. Okay? Same thing with the tangent line here, right? Same as the slope of that line, same with the slope of this line, same as the slope of that line. Okay? Now what happens is you can get creative, right? You can do all kinds of stuff with Chaikin's algorithm, like this, okay? And you do one quarter, three quarters, Like this, connect the dots. All right, keep going, crank it up, and you get something, uh, finally a curve that looks like this. Usual, these are supposed to be nice and smooth, use your imagination, right, like that. You can see some really wild curves out, okay? by doing these things. And you can get any, effectively any curve you want. Right? Yeah, but it still doesn't tell us how to get that curve. Okay? But almost. All right? Almost. Um, so um, this is Chaikin's curve. Really simple. And this was his lecture, and it kind of blew everybody out. Because what it was was completely different than trying to specify mathematically what you're going to, trying to do, and, the way, and then in, you know work through a math type function, right? This was just a simple little iterative process. Okay, this is now called 
a subdivision curve and it was the first one, okay, by George Chaikin. Okay, about 1974. And he gave this talk at the University of Utah, and you're going to hear me talk about University of Utah a lot in a beginning graphics course because the University of Utah was the first to really have what we call the frame buffer. They built the you know frame buffer that we all have multiple ones of now on our PCs. Then back in the early 70s, they were the ones that actually built the first one. It was a they actually built two of them, great big huge cabinet with a big rotating magnetic drum inside, okay, in a big computer room with all kinds of air conditioning and everything else in order to make these work. But they had the first group that came through and did this. And some of you may know some of the people that came out. They had an incredible set of graduate students. Uh, one is a guy named Ed Catmull, who is currently CEO of Pixar. Pixar okay. One of them, John Warnock, who invented... He was CEO of, most people don't know John, because he probably affects your day-to-day -day life more than anybody else. He was CEO of Adobe for a long time, started Adobe, okay, and he invented both PostScript and PDF, okay, probably affected your life more than anybody knows. Next guy is Jim Clark. Uh, Jim Clark uh, started a uh, small company called Silicon Graphics back in the 80s which uh, finally has died, but he left. He started a second company called Netscape, okay? And before that started to die, he left, and he started another company called Web WebMD. And he's the only person on the planet we know that has started three billion dollar companies, okay? So they had this set of graduate students, oh, there's Jim Kajia, who's now number four at Microsoft. They, I mean, they had this incredible set of graduate students that went through. And they are the ones, and so George Chaikin was invited to come to Utah to give a talk, okay? I still wander out to Utah today because they still have a big graphics group out there and I work with a lot of them, all right? So, okay, so let's take George Chaikin's algorithm and do it here, okay? Well, in order to draw this with Chaikin's algorithm, I gotta get the Chaikin's points, right? How do you do that? Well, what you do is put a few points on the line here. Okay, like this. Put a few points on the line. Okay, and now uh, I'll draw some tangents to the line, to the curve here. Okay, missed one. <laughs> That's pretty bad. Tangent. Okay. See it? See the Jenkins points? All right? Because we knew that kind of halfway in between over there, kind of halfway in between those segments over there, um, it was uh, um, that's where the curve touched the original Chaikin line, right? The idea is to draw these tangents. And then use these points here as the Chaikin's points. Okay? And zap. Once you draw now the chicken's curve, you can store all these points in your machine, you run them through your chicken's algorithm, draw this chicken's curve. What happens is you get a curve approximating this, right? If it's not to your liking, what do you do? Well, you shift the points around a bit, okay? Until it is to your liking. And it gave us a new process to actually represent a curve. Now we all have nice automatic 
least squares fit type algorithms that automatically put these points on the curves that we draw, right? You draw a curve like this, typically you can select a button in Photoshop and bango, you've got an approximation to it, you know, with a Bezier curve or with a with Chaikin's curve. Um, but this is the whole idea, is that all you have to do is sketch out a curve that you want to draw, okay, and then start drawing some tangents to it and find the Chaikin's points. Once you find the Chaikin's points, Bango, use George's algorithm, and off you go. Okay? And you can generate curves. And eventually you generate a whole bunch of little points, connect them up with little straight lines, which is easy in OpenGL. Okay? And you're done. So this was the thing behind George Chaikin's curve. Okay? And uh, by the way, uh, I knew that um, this isn't really great for a tangent going through here, but I knew, for example, uh, after doing this for a while. Um, this is an inflection point in the curve. Okay, it's the only, I think it's my only inflection point. The inflection point in the curve. I had to put a point there so my tangent was tangent at that inflection point, and I'll show you why. Okay? I'll show you why. Alright, so immediately once George gave this talk, <laughs> all the mathematicians in the room said, what curve is he actually talking about? Right? Can I actually get the function for that curve, for George's curve? And the answer was, no, of course not, never works in math, right, to do this, and it doesn't. It never works, right? But interestingly enough, in this case, it does. Right, you can actually write down what the function is after you're done. And so then you can uh, use that function to calculate derivatives and everything else, and that's what I'm gonna do the rest of this, co this time, is show you, right, what this function is, and it's going to look remarkably similar to the affine transformations I wrote down yesterday. Okay? Remarkably similar. So, okay, so everybody get the idea how to do Chaikin's algorithm? It's about as easy as you can think of. Okay? Now, there's a, there's a three dimensional Chaikin's algorithm. Let me just throw this out in front of you because we're going to have to look at this a little bit later. I guess I'll wander over here. Suppose you had not um, a bunch of Chaikin's points here, but a bunch of Chaikin's points like this. You had a two-dimensional array of Chaikin's points. Okay? Right? That, that effectively all the Chaikin's points there, we can line up in a one-dimensional array. Suppose you had a two-dimensional array of Chaikin's points. Okay? So, um, So there's kind of this 2D array. Whoop, one more. Okay. Well, you can do a, a one-quarter, three-quarter algorithm here, too. Uh, it has to be a little interesting. But there's kind of one-quarter and three-quarters of the way along that line, one-quarter and three-quarters of the way along this line, one-quarter and three-quarters of the way along that line, one-quarter and three-quarters of the way along that line. Connect the dots. And here's your, take, your new one quarter and three quarter points on the inside of that cell. Okay? And you can do this for each square, right? And you got a whole bunch of new chickens points. And then you do it again, you do it again, you do it again, you do it again, you get out a surface that actually looks pretty smooth. So there's a, uh, nobody uses this by the way. But there's some, I'll show you. There's some problems with this one. Okay? And there's some problems with this one. And so, uh, uh, we all use another one called Catmull Clark that's named after Ed Catmull and Jim Clark, the two guys I just, ex I just talked to you about, okay? Named after those two. So, okay, let's, let's do the simplest Chaikin's algorithm we can. I'll show you what goes on, okay? And to do this, I'm going to do it from Bezier's point of view, okay? I'll do this one from Bezier's point of view and show you what Bezier was doing. And, uh, and we'll go from there, okay? So here we go. Uh, let's put this down here. I'm going to do only three points initially. Okay? I'm going to do only three points initially. And I'll, um, I, once I do three points, you'll see how to do four, how to do five, how to do six, etc. Or if you don't, I'll show you. Okay? Now the idea is to take these three points P0, P1, P2 and develop a curve, like Chaikin's did, almost. 
Now I'm not going to do I'm not going to do one to quarter, three quarter. I'm going I'll do this from Bezier's point of group view, and then later I'll show you it's the same. Okay. So here's uh, what Bezier did. Bezier said, take these points like this. Okay. Assume the curve goes through these two, right? These two endpoints, and assume that this point up here is this attractor that attracts the curve to it. Okay. And how are we going to get a new point on the curve? Well, what Bezier said was, I'm going to take the midpoint of this line segment, and I'm going to take the midpoint of this line segment, okay? And I'm going to take, I'm going to connect the dots here, and I'm going to take the midpoint of that line segment, and I'm going to say this is another point on the curve, okay? That's another point on the curve. So I can generate another point on the curve by doing this midpoint, midpoint, midpoint type things, right? Calculating three midpoints, which is actually pretty easy. Well, the, this is like so what? But when you look at this, it all of a sudden becomes really clever because you started with two points that he said the curve was on these two points and you had one attractor and you calculated a new point on the curve and all of a sudden it's like, ooh, I've got two points on the curve and another point I can use as an attractor, right? And over here I have two points on the curve, right? And I have another point I can use as an attractor. So what do you do? You take the midpoint here, midpoint here, connect the dots, take the midpoint. That's another one on the curve. Okay? Take the midpoint here, midpoint here, connect the dots. That's another. Take the midpoint there, and that's another one on the curve. See what I'm doing? And at each step here, you've got two points on the curve with a, an attractor point in between. Okay? And you play the same game. Kind of s different game than what Chaikin did, but close, okay? But close to the same game. And what happens is you keep going, right? This is just recursion, folks, right? You'll see it over and over and over again in this course. It's called divide and conquer recursion. Right? You can't solve a problem, you divide it into two pieces, right? You try to solve them. If you can't solve that problem, you divide it into two pieces more. Okay, and you keep going until it becomes easy, easy to solve. Easy to solve here is when maybe it's the line segments connecting things are really short. And you get this curve that goes up here, right? Okay, that's what Bezier did. Well, let me see here now. I have to draw a similar picture. Uh, these are identical, right? <laughs> Okay, P0, P1, and P2. P0, P1, and P2 are called the control points again. Same type of thing. Now these are similar. Now, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a curve here. And what Bezier said was this curve is going to be, say, P of T for some parameter T. All right? And what I want to do is say that P of 0 is equal to this this point. That's where it starts at zero. P of one is this point over here. And I have some other hints. Here's P of a half, maybe. And that makes some kind of sense because I took half of a half of a half to get there, right? I used half of a half to a half. Here would be P of a quarter. Here's P of three quarters. Okay? And so you see I'm kind of filling these things in, okay, as I go along. And what I want to do is, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write down P of T, okay? And the hint on this, without going through a full proof or anything else, the hint on this is as follows. Um, suppose instead of taking halfway along this curve here, I took a quarter of the way along this curve, quarter of the way along here. Instead of doing halfway along, I'm going to take only a quarter of the way along. And I'm going to use a, that quarter. So instead of halfway along here, I take a quarter of the way along. I connect the dots, right? The straight line, connect the dots. And instead of taking halfway along here, I take a quarter of the way along. And I look at that point, okay? Instead. And um, this point is. You know, you can play all these games, right? For any, I, I could take any fraction 
I wanted between zero and one, and I could play this game. I get it three quarters of the way along, and three quarters of the way, and three quarters of the way. And I could play this game. Half is the easiest one. But it doesn't take too long to look to find out that if you do quarter, 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 that if I go back over here to this picture, and you have to kind of tra these are think of these as the same, and if I extend this line up here like that, okay, that this point here is the one that's a quarter of the way along this segment, right? This point here, it's halfway between these two, it's the quarter of the way along this segment. And this one here, which I said was p of a quarter on the curve, is a you can see it's a quarter of the way along this segment. You have to draw it out, you have to use your high school geometry a bit, but these two lines are equal in length, right? So this is a quarter of the way along here. Okay, see it? You see what I'm going to do next? I'm going to get p of t by saying, how do I get p of t now? What I do is I go t of the way along this thing, t of the way along this one, and t of the way along this one, and I can get a point on this curve for any t. Okay, I just ran a lot by you. You okay? Okay, I can get it for any t. All right, you okay with that? So here we go. What's it? Let's let's look at this little picture over here, okay? And let's calculate this first point. Oh, let me label them, okay? Uh, these labels have been kind of traditional. It's kind of funny. Uh, this this algorithm's got so famous. These labels are kind of traditional. So this one I'm going to call P1 upper one, right? It's kind of the the new the upper one means it's the new point on that line, right? It's a new point on that line. And then here's my new line, which is kind of the P1 line. P upper 2 is the new point on that line. And I can write these guys down. I can say that P of t, here we go, is equal to, it's going to be P22. Right? And I know what P22 is. It's, aha, how do you go one quarter of the way along this, that one? Well, if you remember the other lecture the other day, Whoa, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, oh, how do you go t of the way along? Thank you. 1 minus t times p1, 1, 1 plus t times p2, 1. Okay? Uh, I'll, if you remember the lecture last time, this was what I said. Here's the affine combination of those points because the, uh, the, the uh, coefficients add up to 1. And if you look at it, it's really uh, p, I start at p1, and then I add t times the vector p2 minus p1 on. Right? So I go t of the way along that vector. Makes some kind of sense. So this writes p22 in terms of p11 and p21. Okay? If I look then and write this out, I can write out now what p11 is also, because I know it's t of the way along the other. That first line. So, okay, 1 minus t times p11. Well, that's 1 minus t times p0 plus t times p1. Okay? Gets messy. All right? Plus t times p21, which is 1 minus t times p1 plus t times p2. See, have, I'm moving t of the way along the line p1 to p2. Okay? And so you write it all out. This is uh, 1 minus t squared times p0 plus, let's see, here's a t times 1 minus t there on p1, and here's a t times 1. Oops. Here's a t times 1 minus t here on p1. Right? That's two of them. Plus, I think there's t squared, p2. Okay? Recognize this from last lecture? Okay? 
And when you start writing this down for what Bezier did, you say, ah, because it's a quadratic polynomial here, right? So this thing has to be a parabola. It's one way of writing a parabola. Okay, it's got a quadratic polynomial in front of it. So this says Chaikin's curves, right, this Bezier curve over here is made up, of, it's just a parabola. That's all it is. Okay. So as I trot back over here to my Chaikin's curve, when I look at these guys here, these pieces here, like this one up here, right, this piece here, you know, this Chaikin's curve, it touches the points, if you look at it, it touches the points that are halfway in between, okay, here, okay, if, and, uh, oops, let me try it again. Touches this point, uh, let's see, here's a C point, a Chaikin's point. So here's one here, and here's the other one here, right? And what, this is where it touches, ah, intersects, and here's the Chaikin's point. And this is the analogous to that little picture I drew right there, right? That the curve goes through the two endpoints, and, right, there's one point off the curve that attracts it. And it's not too far of a stretch to see that, oops, this segment here has to be a parabola, okay? That segment has to be a parabola. And not only the one, I can actually write down the mathematical function of that parabola in there. And so what George Chaikin did with this one-third, two-thirds algorithm that he presented, or one-third, two-thirds, sorry, three, one-quarter, three-quarter algorithms that he presented, what he did was, all he did was present a way to piece together a whole bunch of parabolas, okay? He just pieced together a whole bunch of parabolas and made it look like the curve that you were going. It's kind of clever, right? Because you actually, actually it works, okay? Now, the reason I had to put a point here at the inflection point, parabolas don't have inflection points, right? So if I'm piecing together parabolas and my curve has an inflection point in it, the only place I can get, the only way I can get an inflection point is the inflection point has to be where two of those parabolas come together. Okay? That's the only way I could get an inflection point there. So when you draw these things, you have to put a point, you have to remember to put a point at your inflection point because Chaikin's curves is only pieces together parabolas. Okay? Go ahead. Well, when you're, when you're sketching these things, you're going to have to guess, okay? It looks like an inflection point, right? Curvature goes one way on one side and one, the other way on the other side, okay? Or if you draw a straight line tangent through the inflection point, you have to curve ought to be on one side of the straight line on one side and the other side of the straight line on the other side. So once... It, it, what was interesting, it took about two years, well, let's see, I should say, I've got to say one more thing, is that with this, this curve here, this is piecing together parabolas, okay? A parabola is a, is a uh, polynomial curve, right? It's got t squared in it. It's poly, what we call a polynomial curve. And um, when you piece together polynomial curves, those are no, normally called splines, okay? And this happens to be a quadratic Turned out it happened to be a quadratic, right? Because it's got two on the uh, power. It's a quadratic B spline, it turned out. Okay? B splines were invented in 1946. And so all of a sudden, George gave this lecture, he got everybody excited, and it's like, ah, oh, he's just doing, you know, he's just doing uh, quadra piecing together quadratics, and this has already been done back in the 1940s. Well, it turns out that it, it hasn't quite been done this way because what George did was actually figure out a way to actually make this process work. Okay. Now let me show you one other thing over here. And there's um, uh, um, lots of this. Suppose I had, it's not too hard to see, if I had four points like this. I have P0, P1, P2, P3, like that. I can pr I can do the same game as George as we did over there. Bezier's Bezier's game. I can play the same game. I can take halfway along here, halfway along here, halfway along here, connect the dots. Take halfway along here, halfway along here, connect the dots. 
and finally take halfway on the last segment and say, aha, that's a point on the curve. Okay? And now guess what? I have two points on the curve and two points in, in between each one, right? So I can play the same game again. And I do halfway, halfway, halfway. I've got to have to do a few more halfways, right? A few more midpoints to get there, but I can get there. Can you see, can you extrapolate this forward in your head really fast and say, ooh, I can do this with 27 points? Okay? I can do this with 27 points. And what would happen if I started with this procedure with this one? Well, I can still write it all down. It gets really messy now. Okay? I can still write it all down, and I get over here, P of T for this one happens to be 1 minus T cubed, P0 plus 3T squared. 3t times 1 minus t squared p1 plus 3t squared times 1 minus t p2 plus t cubed p3. All right, similar except now it's a cubic, okay? And cubic Bezier curves are a lot more popular because they have inflection points for one, okay? A lot of engineers use quintic Bezier curves because then the acceleration, second derivative, is still cubic. You use a cubic curve, you take two derivatives, you get something linear, which is not that great. Okay? And, uh, by the way, I just scribbled this down. There's no magic to this formula, right? Because, I, sh I said this the other day, I start with 1 minus t cubed, right? And I decreased the power of 1 minus t each time I went down. And then I increased the power of t each time I moved. And then 1, 3, 3, 1 is Pascal's triangle, right? 1, 2, 1 is Pascal's triangle for the second level. Next one would be 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. Okay? It, would go, it just goes up. It's really easy to do. So Bezier's curves are kind of more powerful than Chaikin's curves because we can do cubics. Okay? The trouble is, once you get done with this, uh, what people found out is if I have 27 points here, right, running out, a curve with 27 points, I can do this whole thing, take half the wood, half, 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 you just keep going until I get a single value, split it into two pieces, keep going. I can do that. Unfortunately, the polynomial that I get here is, uh, if I have 27 points, it's got a 26 there, right? And it's got like 27 terms to it, okay? And it gets a little bit harder to compute on a computer system that way. None of us like to compute algebra type stuff on computer systems. Okay? And uh, these points, I'll, these points all have similar names. That's P11, P21, this one would be P31. Here's P22 and P32. This final point P33. All right, same type of thing, and we can calculate it all out. Okay, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'm not going to give it as homework. All right, <laughs> you can calculate it all out. It's one of those things you do once in your life, and then you say, okay, I know how it, wor how it works. So, but there's even a better algorithm for computer people that drops out of this, okay? And the algorithm looks like this. It says P of T is equal to P uh, um, I'll say 3, th let me do the 3, 3, 1, which is down there. Doesn't matter. Right. Where P i j is equal to 1 minus T times P I j minus 1 plus T times P I minus 1, j minus 1. If j is greater than 0, uh, yeah, and it's equal to P i otherwise. Okay. Did I blow you away with this one? Because what's happening here, right? It says P33, right? P33 is equal to 1 minus T times P32 plus T times P22, 
right? Which is what I would get if I did it over there. And then each one of those I can plug them back in here. Right? The P22, I can calculate over here. And only when I get down when J is zero do I actually take this last one, the original guy. And so this Bezier curve can be done recursively, right? Can be done recursively because this is a recursive formula because when I do P33, it uses P22, which I have to use this formula to calculate. Now this is all doing all the midpoints, okay? This is doing all the midpoints. Now, it turns out that doing mid midpoints is a much more stable operation on a computer system than doing something to the third power. Much more stable, Man, much less error. Okay? So most of us don't look at the formula here, we look at the recursive formula over there. Okay? And we do what's called this little recursive formula in order to calculate things. Um, so, now what I should say here is the following. <laughs> All right? Bezier curves, they're great. Chagin's curves are also great. You're going to do Chagin's curves for your first assignment. Okay? Bezier curves are great. You're going to see those in this course a lot. Okay? And they have multiple ways to calculate the curve. Okay? We can calculate the curve by doing half, 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 getting another point, splitting it into two pieces, doing recursion on each piece, doing half, 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 right, etc. We can do that. We can calculate it using a math equation, right? This is kind of like doing geometry, right, to calculate points on the curve. We can use it doing a math equation, okay? And oh, by the way, the half, 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 half is all over here, right? That's this one more or less with t equal a half, all right? So you can do it with geometry or you can do it with math. Take your pick, right? Not only that, there's a divide and conquer algorithm with these because as soon as I calculate this point on the curve, I can split the curve into two pieces. I can even forget about one piece if I like and do this second piece. Once Bezier curves were massaged a bit by the research community, they found out that if you take a uh, the old numerical analysis problem of take a cubic polynomial and how do you calculate a cubic polynomial? How do you calculate the roots of a cubic polynomial? The fastest possible way to calculate the roots of a po cubic polynomial? They had all kinds of numerical analysis, Newton's method, this, that, uh-uh. The fastest way to do it is, right, you figure out a box, right, around your thing. If that box doesn't intersect the origin, you know, doesn't, and then you start splitting this cubic curve, doing the half-half-half thing, because you can split it into two pieces, two cubic pieces, each one a Bezier curve. You do the half-half-half on those. All you're doing is this half operation. You shove that half operation down to the GPU, which can be done in parallel and really fast, right? And you have by far the fastest algorithm and the most accurate algorithm to find the roots of a cubic polynomial, okay? This kind of came out of the graphics world is how to solve a problem in numerical analysis that they'd been dealing with for a number of years. So here's these things. Now we even do more complex things than this because Chaikin over there, what he did was he said, okay, I'm going to piece together, he didn't know it at the time, but he pieced together parabolas, okay? Uh, we want to do something better than that in general in engineering. We want to piece together um, cubics at least cubics, maybe other things, okay? And we want to do it in a nice way. And um, the way you do that, oh, I, I should also mention over here, one way to calculate is with geometry, one way to calculate is with math, because you can actually write down the math formula, okay? This never works in general, in math. You get two ways like this, it never works, ever, to do these you know, that you get both of these things to pop out, and you get a recursive, and you get, I mean, all this stuff just popped out on these things. And it never works in general. But it's not too hard to see that if you want to start piecing these curves together, suppose you have these two curves and you want to piece them together, that some things have, you know, here's a Bezier curve, and here's a Bezier curve, you want to piece them together, 
here's piecing cubic pieces together, but all of a sudden it depends on how smooth you want to get. Right? We have to get it so that these two line segments for the point that joins here, where it joins the two, these two line segments have to be equal in length, they have to be collinear. So the tangents are nice, right? Otherwise it comes in and then it goes out with a very sharp corner to get smooth. And you have to start putting conditions on this. And this is when you get into, these things are called beast blinds. If you stare at OpenGL or at your book long enough, you'll see the term beast blinds. Okay? And um, it turns out that when you start moving up to try to piece these together, you, all this beauty that's over here starts to fall apart. Okay? Trying to write down the, the, what this function actually is, is one of the biggest messes you've ever seen, okay? I actually give a graduate course on this, and one of my lectures is I do a, something called the De Boer Cox calculation from 1978, where we actually try to write down this function. You can do it, but it's, it takes, you know, uh, blows out a graduate class and it takes, uh, you know, multiple blackboards to do. However, the beauty about this is that the original, the geometry thing stays in place. You can still use it, okay? And this PIJ formula I wrote over here stays in place. You can still use it, okay? So I've taken you a long way today. I tried to draw curves, okay? You're going to do it using Chaikin's curves, and I, you know, don't, I said draw your favorite political character. Don't everybody do Obama, but the hint is, uh, Go out and, and when you draw a political character, the outline of a political character, um, go out and get something off the political cartoons. Those are the best things to use as prototypes to draw something. Um, but you're going to draw Chaikin's curves. You'll learn a lot by doing this. Uh, again, you're going to draw these points out, get the Chaikin's points. You're going to adjust them around to get what you want. And uh, then you're going to take off. And, and what we're going to do here is we're going to move right into uh, moving things around with matrices on Wednesday. Right? And putting a camera in place, what does the camera look like? Okay, we're going to do some 4D geometry, if you can think of that for a bit, okay, in your head. Don't, you know, don't worry about it tonight. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll start doing that, take a couple lectures to go through that, and then we'll start, eventually we're going to come back to these and draw surfaces. So that'll be fun.